Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. Uh, last week, we began uh, a new study uh, looking at the Ten Commandments and how they apply to us as New Testament Christians. One of the things we talked about is the different ways that we understand the law of God. Uh, as we read the Old Testament laws, we see three different kinds of laws. First of all, we see civic laws which were how the people of God were to relate to each other, how they were to treat each other with fairness and with equity, uh, how they were to right wrongs that had been done. And while a lot, of, uh, a lot of our legal system today is based on some of those same principles, some of the specifics are different because we live in a quite different day and age. And so a lot of those laws kind of are... Uh, not applicable to us while the principles behind them them are. A second kind of law, not only civic law, we see ceremonial law. Those are the various types of sacrifices and how those sacrifices were to be made, how the at first tabernacle and then the temple were to be set up, how things were to happen daily in the temple, who the priests were, how the priests were to conduct themselves, uh, what kinds of sacrifices were to be made at what particular times, how the people were to be holy, uh, set apart before the Lord, and what happened when they were ceremonially impure, how they could be made ceremoni ceremonially pure again, so forth and so on. So a lot of that, um, that, that law that dealt with their, um, the, their worship ceremony, uh, we understand that much of that was, or all of that was fulfilled in Christ, that he became the once for all sacrifice for our sins. There no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins because he died once for all for us. And in him, we have complete and total forgiveness and are made holy before God. We've been given his righteousness. So we're not uh, bound to keep those ceremonially, um, uh, those laws that are ceremonial by nature. But then we also can observe the moral law of God within the Old Testament law. Uh, those are the definitions of what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what is, as, as he said, what is life and what is death, what is blessing, what is cursing. And um, through these laws, we understand the moral nature of God. And even as New Testament believers, while we have been redeemed by Jesus and forgiven by Jesus, it becomes our heart's desire to want to please God. And because of our love for God, to want to live for him and please him. And um, the, the moral law that we see gives us a great picture of who God is and what pleases him. And we know that we'll not perfectly do that. And that's why we're thankful that we have uh, forgiveness for our sins in Jesus, and that ultimately we are accepted in him. But still, we, we come to understand and know the nature and characteristics of God by his moral law. And so with that in mind, as we look at these Ten Commandments, we're going to look for the principle behind each one of these commands. Uh, why did God command that? What was it about his character and his nature that uh, that caused him to command his people to behave in a certain way. Last week, we looked at the first commandment, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me. To understand that God has uh, pursued a, a, an exclusive personal relationship with us and that God wants that kind of relationship. He, he doesn't want rivals for our affection. And that in the New Testament, we see that in Christ. Christ is our Savior, is our Redeemer, as our Lord. As Paul said to the Colossian church, in everything, he wants to have first place. That every facet of our life stems from this dynamic, growing relationship, transforming relationship we have with him. And how, uh, how he lives interactively through every relationship that we have. So uh, we're going to look at the second commandment today and uh, kind of gain some principles from that. The second commandment deals with not making carved images, and we'll look at our scripture in just a moment. But I want you to think past little wooden statues or porcelain statues or even metal statues that may be uh, cast uh, that we often think of when it comes to idols. And I want us to think of 
ways in which we create mental images of God, or even spiritual images of God, philosophical images of God. How do we try to fashion God in ways that we understand and to be aware of that? So I'm going to pray, and then we'll dig into our scripture. So join me as we pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Now, make that word plain to us today. Show us who you are. Show us what you've done for us in Christ and how because of being in Christ, we are free to be who you've created us to be from the very beginning. Before sin tainted the image of God in us, how you created us to be. This kind of relationship that you want us to have in you. So, Lord, I pray that your spirit would guide us today into your truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's move into our scripture. So, our scripture today, again, comes from Exodus chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments. Um, and we're going to begin reading today in verse number four and read down through verse six, where the Lord says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." We've talked about the principles behind the commandments, and the principle that I want us to see today that I, I think it's important for us to know about the character and nature of God is that God cannot be contained. And we, we call this God's transcendence. God cannot be contained. He, he lives over and above his creation. And so the reason he didn't want his people creating an image and worshiping an image, and it wasn't, this kind of was, was twofold. It, it was, first of all, there didn't need to be an image that represented another God, like the cultures around them had their own gods and a different image for each of those gods. He... He was not to be like that. He, he, he could not be contained in an image, but just from their own understanding that they wanted, he wanted them to understand that God lived above everything that he created. And, you know, whatever they used to make a statue that they would call God, and by the way, we know now, reading through Scripture, we read a few verses beyond the Ten Commandments. This was the very first commandment they broke. They made the golden calf. And uh, they made that golden calf to represent God. They, they tried to, to squeeze God into this physical image and make a physical image represent him. The problem with that is the items that they used to make this representation were things that God himself had created. So they were, they were using the lesser to try to represent the greater, and that just doesn't work. Uh, that would be the equivalent of trying, you know, to run a thousand volts through two hundred and twenty volts, a uh, two hundred and twenty volt system. You know, you blow fuses everywhere. Or you know, they were blowing, um, they were blowing spiritual fuses using the creation to try to represent the creator. It just didn't work, and it doesn't work in our life today either. And so, I want us to consider some of the ways that, that we we do that. Uh, when God was reissuing the law to his people, uh, reminding them of that in Deuteronomy, there was this very interesting case in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And he's reminding them of the day that he showed up, uh, and they showed up at Mount Horeb, and he gave the Ten Commandments. And notice what he said as he, he described that day. Um Verse 12, the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. And it reminded them, therefore, watch yourselves carefully. Verse 15, since you saw no form on that day, God does not have 
form. God does not have a form. He cannot be contained. And what happens is, if we're not careful, by trying to create a form, we reduce God. Now, what I want us to think of in terms of, um, I want us to think in terms of non material forms today. And I want to just suggest uh, real quickly, maybe three ways that if we're not careful, we try to reduce God. First of all, we try to reduce God in our concept of who he is, concept. And by that, I mean, we try to define God. Um, well, I just don't believe God would this. Well, my God would never. Well, you know, me and God, we've got our own thing going. I, I hear that every now and then from people. There's even a country song from way back. Me and God have our own thing going. Have our own. We we got our own thing worked out. And so we 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 fashion a concept of who God is based on our understanding, our limited human understanding of who God is. We need to be careful about that. God is who he says he is, not who we think he is. Now, let me repeat that, because I don't want you to miss that. Uh, the whole 25 minutes of video we have today, I don't want you to miss that one statement. God is who he says he is, not who we think he is. And so we can come up with all these ideas of who we think God is, but if it is not who God has revealed himself to be in his word, we have reduced God to a mental idol or a conceptual idol, a conceptual image in our own mind of who he is. So we, we reduce God in our concept of who he is. Um, we also tend to reduce God to match our preferences. Now, understand, there are three levels in descending importance. There is truth. That Truth is universal. Truth is absolute. Uh, by absolute, I mean there is no arguing about it. It is real. We can try to deny it. We can say it doesn't exist, but it's it's there. It's not dependent on our acceptance of it. Truth is truth. It's universal in that means that it's always true. It's always true for anybody, everybody, anytime. Conviction is specific to a person and a situation. That's usually based on truth. It is a particular way of applying truth. I'll give you an example. Um, there are people who believe that you should wear you're, you're like a suit and tie if you're a man or a dress if you're a woman to church. Now, there's nothing wrong with wearing a suit and tie if you're a man or a dress if you're a woman to church. Now, if you get that backwards, there's something really wrong with that. But we, that, that's another, another episode for another day. But um, there's nothing wrong with that. But when we say that anybody, if any man who does not wear a suit and any woman who does not wear a dress to church is wrong, we are taking our conviction and trying to make it a universal truth, universal absolute truth. The reason that people who believe they should wear suits and dresses to church is because they believe in their heart that helps them reflect the, the holiness of God. And, and I don't argue with that. I understand that. That's great. Um, but that's not the only way to understand the holiness of God and to revere the holiness of God. And so, uh, you know, I think there are other expressions of that as well, hard expressions of that uh, as well. 
So that's a conviction. It, it's a fine thing. There's nothing wrong with it. And it's important for that person. It helps that person apply truth, but it's not necessarily universal. It can't be applied to everybody all the time, anywhere, and it's not absolute, all right? But then the third level is preference. Preference is just what I like. Um, I like to do this, and so because I like to do this, everybody else should know. Well, that's not the case. If I like it, it's fine to have our likes and dislikes, but we can't expect everybody to have the same likes and dislikes we do. Now, here's where we're going with this. We cannot squeeze God into our definition of conviction and preference. In other words, here's how it happens. Well, if it if 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 people aren't dressed in if men aren't dressed in suits and women aren't dressed in dresses and music in a certain way and we're sitting not sitting we're sitting in pews instead not sitting in pews but sitting in chairs if it goes against my convictions or if it goes against my preferences see music would be a preference um chairs pews it's a preference uh there's nothing wrong with either one of them it's just the way you like it better but when we begin to say any of this is not god if it doesn't match my belief on it We've tried to squeeze God and we we have reduced God to our preferences. So if we're not careful, we create an idol in things, an idol in clothes, an idol in music, an idol in a building, an, an idol, you know, whatever the case may be. We, we have reduced God to something physical. We try to define God by something physical. Remember the passage we read in Deuteronomy, God said, I have no form. We try to give God form when we do that. And then a third way, I think, is that we, we reduce God to our expectations. Uh, if it doesn't happen the way we think it ought to happen, it wasn't God. If it's not done the way we think it should be done, then it's not God. And Usually, that comes from, I think, at least a, a, a good heart at the beginning. I think people mean well because they don't want to run off into error and heresy. But I think it's important to understand that God often acts in ways we do not understand, ways we do not see. There are things that God is doing that we in realms that we cannot see. So to reduce God to our expectations and to say, well, you know, if it didn't match my expectations, it wasn't God, then um, we're reducing God to a form, a form of, of circumstances. I'll give you a good example on this one, then we'll move on. Um, it's one of my favorite stories. A preacher was preaching one day, and um, after the sermon, after the service, went out into the lobby, we're meeting people, and they came out. This lady came out, was obviously unhappy. She had, you know, her, her cornflakes had just been a little stale that morning or something. She was just in a bad mood. But she said, Preacher, I just want you to know I didn't get anything out of worship today. He just smiled. He said, well, that's okay. You weren't the one we were worshiping. Uh, you know, sometimes we feel like, well, if it didn't go, if it didn't make me feel the way I thought I should feel, if it didn't give me warm fuzzies, if I didn't cry or if I didn't feel emotions, if it didn't make me laugh or whatever the case may be, then God wasn't in it. And we, we reduce God to a form. And remember what he said in Deuteronomy 4. There is no form. God does not take a form. He cannot be. He's transcendent. He cannot be contained in a form, not even in a circumstantial form, not even in a conceptual form, uh, not even in the form of, of clothes or buildings or music or whatever the case, God cannot be contained. So let's bring this to the New Testament. So how are we to understand this in the New Testament? Well, understand that everything that we need to know about knowing God has been revealed to us in Christ. Consider these two verses. In John chapter 1 and verses 14 and 18, describing the coming of Jesus, John said this, and the word, that was the way in his book he was introducing Jesus, the word became flesh 
and dwelled among us. Look at this. Took on form. The God who could not be formed took on a form. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 says that God who was uh, equal with God did not consider his equality with God something to be held on to, but he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. So this God who had no form took on a form. So here's, here's, here's the important truth. God does not fit into our molds. He made his own mold. And that was in Jesus. The word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of the grace of truth. Now look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the father's side. This, by the way, he was referring to Jesus. He was making a case for the divinity of Jesus in all of this. That's kind of the primary thing going on. So don't get lost in that. But this Jesus, who was God, became God in the flesh for us, and he has made him known. Later in a description or a conversation with his disciples, the last meeting Jesus had with his disciples before his crucifixion. This is right after those tremendous words in John 14 that most of us know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Uh, if it were not so, I would not have told you I go to prepare a place for you. But I go and prepare a place for you and I will come, you know, so forth, so on. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Uh, no man comes to the Father except through me. As Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. Show us the Father. Give us a form. Let God be seen to us in a form, and it will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is God in human form. Jesus is God in human form. All right, so let's bring this home. All right, if God cannot be contained, but he has voluntarily chosen to reveal himself in a form, if we want to know who God is, we need to do away with our man-made concepts, our man-made preferences, our man-made expectations, and lose all of that in Jesus. Study the life of Jesus. Learn the life of Jesus. Draw close to Jesus. Look at the concepts that Jesus presented about who God is, and we'll understand God. Look at how Jesus demonstrated the preferences of God, and we'll know who God is. Look at how Jesus fulfilled the expectations of God, and we'll have proper expectations of God. Here's what I want to challenge you to do today. I want you, I want you to, as you pray today, I want you to pray and ask God through his Holy Spirit to reveal to you Ways that you have created an image of God in your own mind or your own understanding. In other words, if it's God, then it's going to be this way, this way, this way. All of the definitions that you have created for God. Um, one of the verses I have, it didn't show you. Psalm 100, verse 3. Um, know that the Lord, Jehovah, he is God. It is he that has made us, and we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. In one verse, all of those he's. It's a reminder to us that we are the created. He is the creator. And he has revealed himself in his son, Jesus. And so let's make our preferences secondary. Uh, let's make our 
concepts of who God is only consistent with Jesus's revelation of who God is, let's be aware that we're often in danger of trying to fashion God into the form that we want God to be, but God doesn't fit our mold. And let's learn Jesus. Let's let Jesus reveal to us who God is, what God expects, and how God wants to change our life. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you thankful that, that he came to be the way, not show the way, be the way for us to be right with God? And that by gazing on his life, as John said in John 1, we beheld his glory. Beheld his glory, gazed at it, looked at it in amazement. Let me challenge you as you read your scripture. Look for the glory of Jesus. Look for the glory of God in Jesus. Gaze at it. Behold it. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. That's what you'll find when you gaze. You'll, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. Wow. So turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth and your own concepts and your own little mental idols of who God is will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Hope it's a challenge. Hope it's helpful. And I hope we'll see you next time. God bless you. Until then.